<laughs> Welcome to Smash Metafiction. This week, we unearth the pieces of our favorite old stories and stitch them together into a brand new abomination that we like to call Collaboratory. Joining me this week are Kit Mulcairin. Why did you get, like, the stuff for this lab? Because it looks like Frankenstein decided to have sex with every single thing in a Pier 1. You know what? I'm leaving. Dan Mulcairin. Oh, hello. I didn't see you come in to your own ears, <laughs> I guess. And Megan Bob. I mean, I hope you don't mind. I've just been, like, putting up some posters of the periodic table and stuff. I just need sprucing up. Don't touch that! Frankenstein fucked it! <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar, Collaboratory is a show where all of us bring together characters and plot elements from other stories, and we strip them down into their base elements just till they're just an archetype. And then based on what everybody's got, we try to stitch together a premise and the beats for a movie in the style advocated by the book Save the Cat, which is for writing 90s style high concept uh, four quadrant movies. So... It is that time, everyone. We are going to open up the Tupperwares, unwrap the foil, and see what everyone brought. Who wants to go first? I will go first. Dan, who uh, who did you bring for your character this week? Uh, my character this week is Sheila the She-Wolf from Glow. Oh, yay! Oh, dude, that's way good. Why don't you tell us about uh, Sheila a little bit and what sort of archetype she represents to you and what you like about that archetype. Sheila is from Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling on Netflix. She is a, a professional wrestler, uh, kind of an amateur up-and-coming professional wrestler. She very strongly identifies as a wolf. She dresses in wolf fur and heavy eyeliner at all times. She is very socially awkward and uh, performs a lot of strange animal behaviors in ways that are largely inappropriate. All right, who wants to go next? I'll go in this little Tupperware. It's an extra big one, as you can see, because it's got an animal in it. Uh-huh. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> But is it an animal or is it a people? Oh shit, it's Luna from Sailor Moon. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Kim, why don't you tell us a little bit about Luna and uh, what archetype she represents to you? Luna is the magical girl familiar character that often acts as an advisor. So she's an advisor to Sailor Moon and the other Sailor Scouts really way later find out she's a person, specifically an alien from the planet Mao, and their whole race turns into can turn to cats or people. Cool. Um, do you want to go next, Bob, or should I? He, uh, yes, I will be just fine going next. Sure. So in this this container that I brought with me, I bring you uh, Jareth from the Labyrinth. Oh, oh shit! Okay. There's another like person, animal situation? Yeah. To- All right, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Jareth and what archetype he represents? I think... The thing that I'm most interested in about Jareth is that bad guy, but also not terribly committed to a lot of the bad guy-ness type things, not really interested in being super aggressive or dangerous, just generally an asshole. (laughs) Um, And then also that real obsession with rules and also rule kind of bending and breaking and going, no, these are the rules. I don't know why you thought these other rules were the rules. I know I made those rules, but also fuck you. Much like a monarch, his final word is what matters. <laughs> I mean, and most importantly, as we all know, David Bowie. Very good. The character that I decided to bring this week, and I can, I can already tell I, I love what we're going to make. I'm like, <laughs> my mind's already on fire. And it's great. Um <laughs> I brought Victor Frankenstein uh, yes. from, from the novel Frankenstein. Talk about <laughs> prophecy here. <laughs> so I think this is going to be real good. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Victor Frankenstein is a scientist. He has an origin story that's in more or less detailed and specific based on what adaptation you're going of off it. But basically, his mother died when he was young, and he became obsessed with trying to overcome death after that. And he ended up creating a monster that was stitched together out of parts from different dead people, managed to get to life, and then was horrified by what he created and fled from it. The monster, without being raised properly, became kind of dark and twisted and violent, and came to him 
wanting to have a mate built for it, and then he started building a mate for it, and then got second thoughts and killed the mate. And then the monster got upset that Frankenstein, you know, didn't build him a mate, and then started, like, killing people in Frankenstein's life and generally being a nuisance and a terrible person <laughs> until they uh, kind of end up destroying each other in the end. It's a little ambiguous, but that's basically what happens. So I think he's the archetype of the sort of uh, mad scientist guy who meddled with things that need not be meddled with and then kind of couldn't follow through and freaked out about it. Claire, you said nuisance. I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great description. Oh, no. what a pesky like, monster. Like, <laughs> like killing killing your wife on your wedding night. Oh, that's, what, what a real nuisance. What a real thorn in my side this guy has turned out to be. <laughs> we can mark this on our calendar. This is the first time in collaboratory history where we've had more than one male character in oh, the cast. Oh, that's true. Yeah, up, at, up until now, it's, it's always been two human women, one <laughs> human man, and one non-speaking non-human <laughs> so so it's the first time where all of our characters can speak and we have more than one man in addition to the characters we've all brought additional plot elements the setting a goal a macguffin and a genre dan you went first what was your additional plot element that you had to bring so I was charged with bringing the setting. The setting that I have brought for us to play around in is the Mos Eisley Cantina from Star Wars. <laughs> okay, oh, all right. my. Explain to us the Mos Eisley Cantina and what this sort of represents and what, what part of it you want to carry over. The cantina appears in uh, Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. It's Luke Skywalker's first real exposure to the universe at large. You know, up till that point, he's been this farm boy living in the middle of the desert, just going to these little podunk towns. And the cantina is this very striking moment when he sees dozens and dozens of different aliens from all over the galaxy. You can just see on his face when he's looking around that, like, his mind is kind of blown a bit. And that's what I liked about the cantina and that I kind of want to take as a setting is that it's sort of an island of cosmopolitanism in the middle of what could be bland like ruralness it sort of represents like a crossroads or a gateway into like a larger uh world or a larger setting what you're saying is you've just taken your first steps into a larger world yeah more or less mm. oh and also to rip <laughs> off star wars quotes uh it is a wretched hive of scum and villainy that was the other thing i was going to ask because that's another part do you want you want to preserve that as well i imagine right the whole it's it's pretty dangerous and there's a lot of shady characters yes around, right? I, I think that that kind of comes with the territory because you know it represents the wider world and with that wider world also comes danger all right so kit what did you bring as your plot element i had to bring the macguffin so let me just uh oh i i think this is the witchblade oh who's gonna put this oh, on okay oh, i like this so much i can't even tell you tell us about the witchblade kit so the witchblade is this weapon it only wants to be on women and once it is a sort of it's like a gauntlet is that typically how it looks? Yeah, it merges with its potential host via a gauntlet, but then can like spread over its host and become armor and can like create weapons for it and that sort of thing. And it does not like to be removed. It will like actively destroy whatever tool you're trying to use to take it off. Also, it, very um, provocative hemlines. <laughs> very true. <laughs> outfit. Gives you all sorts of superpowers too, but like also makes you in a real sexy, spiky outfit. Megan Mob, what did you bring for your plot element? Uh, I brought the genre. And the genre that I brought is the comedy of manners. <laughs> uh, you kind of have to explain. <laughs> okay. Right. No, God you are familiar. God bless you, Megan Bob. You are actually probably familiar with it from either most things that Oscar Wilde ever wrote. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever seen any Oscar Wilde thing, it's a lot like that. If you've ever seen an episode of Jeeves and Wooster, it's the, always that. I think the, the most basic way to describe it is that something fairly simple goes wrong. A coincidence even or an accident and then recovering from that is an ordeal that requires the rest of the play the rest <laughs> of the episode because you cannot do it in ways that would be effective because that would be rude or would be considered breaking the rules of class or whatever you have to do it in the way that you know to the manor board all that stuff and uh, so everything's always a problem and you could fix it if you were willing to ever break the rules but you're not 
So it's like a farce, but it's it's based a lot more on like social norms and stuff like that as opposed to like slapsticky things. Yes, there can be definitely lots of slapstick in it. But yes, yeah, social norms and expectations. Yeah, a lot of the focus of the comedy is on like the absurdity of societal expectations, particularly amongst the higher class. All right, so uh, I got one. My thing I'm bringing is the goal. So break still, everybody. I brought the goal from the movie The Proposition. It is a western and it takes place in australia during like the late 1800s there's three brothers who are criminals they're like bandits and the older brother is like the one who's really bad and evil the middle brother's the main character and he's kind of conflicted and the youngest brother is mostly good and kind of has been brought along but doesn't really want to do anything bad at the beginning of the movie a job of theirs goes wrong and the middle brother and the youngest brother get captured but the older brother escapes and uh the sheriff who knows that the older brother's the really bad one and the other two aren't as bad tells the middle brother who's the main character, that he'll let him go if he tracks down his older brother and brings him to justice. And if he does, he'll let the younger brother go as well. And if he doesn't, then the younger brother's going to get killed in a week. So the premise that I want to carry over is someone has to go undercover in a group or with a person that they used to be loyal to, that they aren't loyal to anymore, a group that they've left. They have to reintroduce it in order to take the group or person down. Wow. Wow. Okay. I mean, I think that that theme can work with comedy of manners. Yeah. Particularly because we're looking to get in with a certain group that would right. have certain, you know, social expectations. That, that, and- was what I, that was how I was thinking we would do it. Yeah, yeah. So does anyone have any initial thoughts? My initial thought, obviously, I set it up this way. Uh, <laughs> L- Luna is the magical girl advisor of whoever puts on the Witchblade Gauntlet. <laughs> that seems fair. I think that a character who makes sense as a protagonist here is going to be Sheila. Yeah. Mm, oh, yeah. She's I putting agree. on that gauntlet. We have a lot of weird shit in this setting already that's begging to be supernatural. I like the idea that one or more of these are the creations of the Frankenstein character who has maybe become like a recluse and run away from stuff. So our MacGuffin is the Witchblade. So if our goal in the plot sense is to infiltrate this group that our main character has some connection to, it seems to me like whoever our antagonist is has the Witchblade, and that's what our protagonist is after. Or alternatively, our character gets the Witchblade early on and is trying to do something, and the bad guys are after them for Mm -hmm. multiple reasons, one of which is that they also want the Witchblade. Like, it doesn't necessarily have to be quite that central, I don't think. I really love the idea of, like, the main character being stuck with this thing they don't want, all this all this trouble is coming their way because of it. It could make sense if Jareth the Goblin King, so we could have him be like an abandoned creation of Dr. Frankenstein who went bad Ooh. and like ended up in power as a sort of like Goblin King monarch thing. Frankenstein was just trying to make a regular owl. <laughs> <laughs> It went so wrong. How did I fuck this up so bad? If we're trying to be like, infiltrate a group, it could be infiltrating Jareth's group, which is like some court of like Mm. goblins and monsters or something. They could all be like outcast creations of Frankenstein. So they're just like all a bunch of like weird, twisted animal things. And Sheila is one of them that used to be there and is now trying to get back in. Jareth could have taken over and is now making his own children. And like, it's possible that Frankenstein will only created like the first few of them, you know, either sure. way. So Okay, so so in that case, because we still need to work Frankenstein into this as a character, not just as like the person who created Jareth and isn't involved in the plot. What if it's that Jareth was one of Frankenstein's earliest creations, rebelled and sort of took down Frankenstein? What if he's holding Frankenstein captive and is forcing Frankenstein to keep making oh, monsters that would be for cool. him? That would be interesting. And so then Sheila's mission is to essentially free or kill Frankenstein so that Jareth loses his ability to create more minions. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay. Um, First of all, can we call him Victor? So that <laughs> just so yes. sure, just just because people think of Frankenstein as the monster and that's yes. a whole thing. So are we going to say then that Jareth's base of operations is the cantina or like the archetypal aspects of the cantina are somehow reflected in his base where it's this sort of like dangerous area with a lot of like eclectic people there? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's the cantina labyrinth. It's not like a really sterile castle where that's like really orderly. It's just a big party and there's a lot of randos hanging around like drinking and partying all the time. Well, like, and see, right? the thing is like it could have been Victor's castle and like Jareth has completely changed the interior of it to match his more chaotic nature, you know, make it more of like a party. So where is this taking place? Like, are we, is this like a fantasy thing? Are we in a modern thing? Is this like a sci-fi thing? Like, what would be the adjective of punk if it was like, like Franken punk? Can that be a type of punk? 
That story is typically seen as very steampunk, though. It would be that, but like a, a little bit less steampunk and a little bit more like towers of crackling electricity and stuff like that. God, yeah, Tesla punk. punk. We're, we're going to have to figure out what the Witchblade is. If it's a mystical object, like actual magic, then that's going to change things because like there's no magic in Frankenstein. You know, it's all like yeah. kind of weird pseudoscience I mean, and science. technology. I mean, he could have used psi magic, science and yeah. magic to do what he did Some with Some Doctor Doom bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, my feeling is that at one point in time, the setting was just more or less historical Europe, like the setting of Frankenstein. But then everything just like evolved way out of control. And it's like kind of taken over the setting. And that little niche technology has kind of grown up a lot. So what I'm thinking that we could do is the Witchblade could be like a more of like an organic like organism thing that Victor Frankenstein made as a thing that can kill his own monsters in case Mm. they ever got out of hand, but he like hit it or something. Thing, and Sheila finds it. So then what's Luna? If, yeah, Luna's uh, supposed to bring it. If this thing was created by Frankenstein. I mean, she could be his old cat who like gained sentience <laughs> through like he like experimented on his cat and like it became smart. Oh, and, Victor, and now you she's would. like taking care of the thing and she's like hiding it and protecting it and she knows stuff about it. Yeah, maybe she got more intelligence than he realized, or she just got more of a spine and a, a will of her own than he realized. Or she could be one of Jared's goblins that rebelled against him. Yeah, I was just thinking possibly a spy, some sort of turncoat from this uh, goblin excess. Oh, okay, how about this? How about this? At the beginning, Victor is in secret making like a weapon that he can use to kill Jareth that he's not telling him about. And he still has his cat with him who he experiments on to be intelligent and Luna's like his lab assistant. Then Jareth finds out about the thing that uh, Victor's working on and Luna manages to steal the little witchblade thing and escape from the castle before that Jareth can get his hands on it. Luna brings it to Sheila, who she knows was a former one of like Jareth's servants or like comrades or something who turned on Jareth and is like living in exile somewhere. And she brings it to her because she knows that she could like wield it and she like doesn't like Jareth and would have motivation and it takes a little bit of her to like, you know, kind of one last job thing and get her to take it up and then go in and infiltrate, but secretly then plan to use the weapon to kill him. I think that that works. I think that that's a a pretty solid setup that sort of keeps everything consistent. We need to give Sheila like a specific goal that she's after, right? Because it's like, it's not enough for her to just infiltrate Jareth's den. There's something specific that she needs to do with this weapon. Uh, Is it just that she's going down to free Frankenstein? Or like, is she also looking to maybe like destroy his machines that create these things? You know, like what's the the goalpost for her? I imagined it would be killing Jareth and then freeing Frankenstein is like a positive benefit that co- that comes with doing that. The parts of this story that are going to be most enjoyable are the moments where Sheila is in this like gang with Jareth, still trying to keep her head down, trying to make it seem like she's cool and she's back and there's nothing unusual going on and like trying to hide what she's really after. So I, I want to try to like elongate that for as much as possible. Yes, so agree. I want to try to minimize the opportunities that she has to get her goal. Luna doesn't get out with the Witchblade. She hides it somewhere in the castle or Frankenstein has hidden it somewhere in the castle. And at the like inciting incident is her meeting Luna and then going into act two is her infiltrating the place. And she doesn't get the Witchblade until around the midpoint. In terms of the way that she usually looks, Sheila's more monstrous, I would argue, than Jareth is. Jareth is really classy. One way we could make it a fish out of water, and I don't necessarily think that we need to, is to make Sheila the uncultured one among the monsters who are all really classy. And she's like the crazy wilderness one. And they're like the fancy ones. Some real Dick Van Dyke Mary Poppins nonsense. The alternative is that they're doing bad monstery things and that she's like a good one. And it's a, it's a little bit more like a sort of undercover cop crime movie in that it's more just like, it's more just an undercover cop. She's trying to be good and they're like wanting to do bad things. I see an opportunity here for something between some element of the comedy of manners, but then also a kind of a miscongeniality thing. Because they're still monsters, but also having some sort of classy element where it's like, no, I can pass as one of these sexy, cool monsters. Does she have to do like some sort of montage where she gets a costume together, but it's like all pointy, scary Victorian stuff or whatever? I don't know. Yeah, and then, you know, gets her fangs shined because obviously having dull fangs would be unacceptable. How gauche. I think, honestly, one of those things that might make for real fish out of water thing is that in Glow, at least, she's pretty guileless. 
Like mm, she's yes. not deceptive. She's not two-faced in a way. She's very straightforward. And I think that the idea of having to lie to these people to get in with them and then betray them later just might not sit well with her because that's also against her nature is being like duplicitous in that way. Jareth's court is classy and uptight and wicked. And Sheila is like chaotic and genuine and good. It can be a little bit like a Ned Stark thing in a way where like they're mm-hmm. duplicitous in that way of like, but also classy and she's more like of the earth and physical. Yeah, I think that that worked. That provides an interesting contrast yes. where she's, you know, she's trying to like put on a suit or a gown or something. And then also like they're trying to push her into doing these wicked things that she's not comfortable with. And so like each of the scenes is sort of her trying to walk that tightrope of not betraying her values and like not doing things that she feels like are going too far, but also not tipping them off that she's only there to like dismantle their whole organization. Okay, so we're not just leaning on the appearance thing. Sometimes it's going to be she's wearing something she's not comfortable with. Sometimes it's going to be like the other goblins are, I don't know, poking a smaller goblin with a stick. Yeah, (laughs) sure. They join in the stick poking and she's like, I, of course, I'm very comfortable with this stick poking. All right, I think we got this, right? Does this seem okay? I think so, yeah. All right. So um, I, I think if, if I'm doing it as like one sentence, I would say basically, yeah, a crude yet repentant monster goes undercover in a group of classy yet cruel monsters in order to defeat its leader. Yeah, there you go. All right. So the next step, we have to work our way through the beat sheet it is the 12 steps that all movies, of course, every single one of them goes through. Prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right. They are opening image, theme stated, catalyst, break into act two, B story, Fun and games, midpoint, bad guys close in, all is lost, break into act three, finale, and closing image. Let's get started with the opening image. We are introduced to one of our main characters. We see who they are and what they want. They're in a relatively stable situation, but something in their life might need fixing. They might also need to learn a lesson. So what is it that we're thinking for Sheila? Is I'm imagining that's who we're starting on here. Although alternatively, this might be a good example of what we what's called a flat character arc which is where the person starts off kind of already knowing the right thing and then they kind of almost lose it or it gets attacked and then they have to end up like kind of standing their ground and maintaining. That's like, for instance, Wonder Woman was an example of that. She starts off already like being the kind of light. Is that what we think we want to do? It's about her like maybe falling or getting corrupted or do you think that she actually wants to learn a lesson by the end of this? I think to stay with Sheila, I think the flat way is better. Yeah, I I agree. agree. Okay. Sheila's the shining light, even when it starts off. It's the rest of the world that that needs to fix itself. Yeah, Yeah, get your shit together, world. I imagine this would actually probably start in the castle with, like, the kind of, like, action-packed cold open thing of, like, Frankenstein telling the plan to Luna and stuff. What what do you guys think about how you want this to go? Oh, man. I love the idea of him whispering to Luna, and then it's sort of... I assume he's in a cell. He's obviously in a cell. And then just the door opens, and there's just, just those boots, and then the dunk, dunk, dunk down the stairs and he's like no go go and luna's like i just wanders like you know gets out between those cool sexy david bowie legs <laughs> yeah i kind of like the idea of uh like opening with like, an action chase scene where there's just this cat running through a castle of monsters yeah! and sort of like evading them, you know, weaving in between them, like jumping up on a ledge and sneaking past some and like going through a window, you know, all that we sort of so thing. We have so many friggin' cats. Kit, why did you bring another cat into the steel <laughs> Oh, I think thing? that was intentional, wasn't it? You think I would bring a cat on purpose to save the cat? <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a weird idea. We're saying that she's not bringing the Witchblade with her, right? It's going to be somewhere in the castle. I think having the Witchblade as like a goal halfway through the movie where it's like, okay, I finally managed to get this weapon by like playing nice and dressing up. You know, either now I can cut loose or like now I need to like further escalate my playing nice and dressing up so I can get close enough to Jareth so that I can actually use it on him. It it occurs to me that rather than it being already made and hidden somewhere, another thing that we could do is that there are pieces of it throughout the castle or like the way to make it is like written in little secret bits around the castle and she has to like put it together and then like make it or something like that i'm okay with it luna can like basically be we have to find the the whatever pieces of it this works okay cool so yeah i think that works so luna escapes the castle does not have the witchblade on her but is looking for someone that she can trust 
to uh, infiltrate the castle and get the Witchblade. Do you feel like Luna is a, the right person to help show Sheila how to infiltrate and help be her co- <laughs> be her uh, Michael Caine to this yes, whole of course, thing? Yes, of course. That, that's, okay. very, that's very much Luna. Yeah, she's she's a great like teacher mentor person. What is Sheila doing when we see her? I picture her like living out on a farm or something or living in the woods or like some kind of simple life. What do you guys think? She's biting into a raw beet. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I said that. I just had an image. Yeah, we're keeping it in. Nah, close up, close up on, close up on raw beat. She bites into it. We pull out slowly. Where is she and what is she doing, Bob? <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. All I had was that beat. Quick, somebody else save me. Oh man, I really like the the idea of the cameras up close on this woman's mouth that looks like it's covered in blood, and then we see that she's actually just eating a beet. Oh, that's very <laughs> good. I could either see her being like completely alone and living like a nice solitary, like kind of hermetic life or alternatively having other people in her life, but, and being kind of just like friendly, but kind of rough and feral with them, like uh, other people that like a little community, but I, you know, it probably makes more sense for her to be like completely alone. Just like, yeah, I think that's that's a cleaner story. Yeah. Like we, we don't need to introduce any additional kind of plot elements. She doesn't have an uncle Owen and an aunt Brew with her. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She's on a moor somewhere. There's a bit of mist. I don't know. We probably just have like a montage of her doing like wilderness survival things, right? Like (sighs) either hunting or or growing food, like making a fire, making like furs for herself or whatever, all that kind of stuff, right? She's probably like stalking through the woods, creeping up on a deer, and then like a twig snaps and the deer runs off and she's like, wow, she punches a log. (laughs) (laughs) In what circumstances does she meet Luna? Do we want to have it her getting saved, like Luna getting attacked by either a wild animal or by people? Oh yeah, she definitely has to save the cat. Yeah. Of course. That, that's actually probably the catalyst. We could do this now or we could do this in a sec, but the other stuff that we have to do is theme stated. So someone either needs to state the theme that the people are going to learn by the end or they need to state the opposite of that. And by the end, the thing that they say are going to be proven correct or proven false. We could have that be something that someone says in one of those opening scenes with Jareth and Victor Frankenstein and Luna and all the monsters. Or this could be something between Luna and Sheila or something as they start traveling. What What do you guys think about uh, what, th- what they should state? I think it makes the most sense for it to come out of dialogue between Luna and Sheila. It's a sort of thing where like Luna initially asks Sheila to come back to the court so that Sheila can help with this. And Sheila can say something along the lines of they think that they're superior because, you know, they dress fancy and they eat nice food and they have all these manners, but they're just monsters underneath. And they look down at me just because I live in the forest, even though like I'm a better person than they are, you know? Right. Okay. So our, our theme that we're going is sort of like, you know, outside beauty or class versus inner like moral uprightitude, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. I, I think it's just like the veneer of seeming civilized. Right. Well, at the same time, you're a monster on the inside. Right. I like that. Uh, is is Jareth, instead of Victor having to get dead bodies, is he having to find babies? <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> dance, magic dance. Oh, man. I think we can we can just have a, a vague, you know, there's a big question mark over exactly where the monsters are coming from, whether they be babies or dead bodies or something else. We can else. have a little Easter egg in the background where like someone's reading a newspaper talking about how baby nappings have increased by 800% recently. But, you know, actually, since since Luna's a cat, Sheila's mm-hmm. a wolf, and Jareth has association with owls, all of the monsters could be former animals. Yeah. Yeah. Animal babies. I was going to somebody just bringing in a cow. Like, what a weird goblin that'll be. There's like this rating of baby farm animals and shit from around the area. <laughs> the petting zoos in the tri-state area have been struck very hard by Jared the Goblin King. <laughs> so now we're at Catalyst. Um, this is where the part where she gets rescued. What what do we think that she gets rescued from? What does Luna get rescued from? I mean, from? obviously a, a river and a waterfall if Milo and Otis and Homeward Bound have taught us Jesus. anything. What's a thing that Luna would have trouble with? Luna's very competent, usually. What if it's a mob of people that are chasing her because they figured out that she's a talking cat? They know that she then is like associated with Jareth and like basically his whole region of the country people don't go there because it's like like that city he's like taken over and it's like oh that's the monster place and if monsters wander away from that then like mobs of people with torches and pitchforks go after them yeah I think that works my initial thought was that she sees some wild animals like chasing this cat and they corner the cat and she like oh damn I want to eat that cat (laughs) and she chases those dogs away and then the cat's like, I found you. <laughs> and she <laughs> flips out. 
That that could actually be a fun inversion. Like she saves her and then she's like just planning on eating her and then she like talks her way out of getting eaten. Sheila could maybe have like a little bit of a um of an arc where she she has maybe spit in the wilderness for so long that she's kind of <laughs> lost a little bit of empathy that she kind of still knows that, but she's like just totally wild. Yeah, she's like a wolf. Yeah, and like isn't used to talking and maybe speaks like not at all or in like one word sentences at the beginning. Do we like that? Yeah. yeah. That's basically Sheila. <laughs> cool. All right. What is the thing that she ends up saying to like convince her to get out of this? And why, why is it that um, Sheila sets beside her like day-to-day life in the woods to go on this journey? What, what is it that Luda does? What if Sheila tried to kill Jareth beforehand oh, yeah. and couldn't? And, and Luna's like, you know, I've, I've come to take you so you can come and kill the Goblin King. And she's like, no, that can't be done. I tried it before. And Luna's like, but there's a weapon now and it's been hidden throughout his castle and it's the one way that we can finally kill him. You're the only one who can do it. Yeah. You're the only goblin that's resisted him. Yeah, right. the only one who actually stood up to him and survived. Oh man, some real Harry Potter stuff. Mm-hmm. The wolf who lived. You're the <laughs> goblin princess. <laughs> Yay! We could say she's in the wilderness because she just keeps having to flee further and further because like the kind of monsters keep spreading or something like that. And she's just like tired of it and and wanted to go after it, but didn't have a, a reason before. So, okay. So break into act two. We're now entering into the main area where most of the action is going to take place. There is oftentimes a symbolic crossing of a threshold that happens at this point. So um, what is what is our break into act two? <laughs> no, I was just thinking of, so there's obviously no mirrors in the woods, but I don't know, some sort of makeover montage thing. And then twirling in front of, I don't know, a shop window in some sort of neighboring town before getting chased off. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that the crossing of the threshold could be a fashion montage yeah. where like they're they're putting together Sheila's <gasps> court outfit and Luna's trying to like teach her, you know, which fork to use when and like all the little niceties of court etiquette. And then like we see her going up to uh, Jareth's lair. Her outfit's not like a like a fancy pretty dress. It's like a weird, unsealy, spiky, like I said, you know, Franken punk, like yeah. badass. Something kind of like Rocky Horror ish. Yeah. <laughs> Where do they get these clothes? Because I was imagining they're gonna have to just steal them off of clotheslines or something. I don't think there's a store. Or I don't know, maybe Luna knows some cool place. I like the idea that Sheila steals a bunch of stuff and then Luna like bakes her the thing. Cause I, I like the idea that Luna can just have an endless supply of whatever skills we want her to have. That's yes. like plot convenient that she can like sew and stuff. She just like knows everything. She's like super competent and she's like running around her with like a little tape measure on her little cat mouth and is like, <laughs> oh. like sewing little things and just making little outfits for her. I think that'd so just be great. Cute. So cute. And then so she's going to arrive at the court. Next up is B story. This is the part where there's oftentimes a subplot, which is either like a, sometimes like a friendship or a romance or some sort of secondary concern or secondary mission that's going on. Um, what do we think for this? Do we think we want it to be like a Sheila and Luna, like buddy comedy kind of stuff going on? Or what do you call it whenever following the villain as they start figuring stuff out and going, I don't like where this is going. Arr. Is that oh, B story stuff? What uh, is that? Oh, when like the the camera changes focus to follow the villain for a little while, so you get like a deeper thing. We could have we could have a Jareth B story. Like he could be like a sort yeah. of him or him or Victor could have their own subplot that we're checking in on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, okay. I feel like Victor as a prisoner, we don't get to see him a lot. Sure. Mm, who, yeah. which one, who Victor or Jareth do you think would be interesting to like? I don't know. Give them <gasps> their own subplot. Wait, do they have a weird, complicated relationship <laughs> as go. creator? That's what I wanted. <laughs> and created. I don't want to force Sheila into this, but I mean, there's just chemistry over there. Yeah, because he's things. a mad scientist. Chemistry. Because he I, I mean, was like, an he, asshole who he, made a human and then rejected them like he, a piece of shit. Sorry. He wanted to make the most beautiful owl man and didn't realize he would make such an evil monster. Is it the th- would it be the thing then that one of them likes the other, but it's like sort of unrequited or the other one is rebuffing? Okay. Or is it like uncomfortable? Uh, Jareth is literally so, having a Sarah making Victor go through no, the, the This is weirder the than that scene. Oh. <laughs> the because the other thing that I was saying is that it could be a two-sided thing, but they're both like reluctant or like not willing to talk about it, but they both feel it. Wait, no, I want to say something about Victor. So in the book, he actually purposefully makes the creature very beautiful and is all about that. But once the creature comes to life is going, oh, no, no, I I did the wrong thing. I shouldn't have done this, but still has these weird, complicated feelings about, I don't know, like about attractiveness. I think that he could have 
that originally he felt very a lot of revulsion and rejected him but now is sort of i don't know coming around on this going you know what you are still beautiful and you are the person i did want to create this friend i mean is that the direction we want to go with this though i, I mean, mean maybe like, not but because i was thinking like it might make more sense if jareth knew about the feelings that victor had for him and like used that in order to betray victor's trust Ooh. and like that's how he was able to imprison him so mean and beautiful I like it. Or Jareth is being a Jareth like he is mm. in Labyrinth. If you watch Labyrinth and try to argue that he's actually interested in Sarah, he goes about it in this really weird way where he's trying to get her to just admit that she likes him. Yep. And maybe he, he's trying to mind fuck Victor in that same way. Uh. Not necessarily because Victor is the most interesting thing to him, but maybe because he could be. But like, <laughs> but it's more of a superiority thing. And it's like, oh, I just nice. want to admit, I want my creator to admit that they tell me you're yeah. proud of me, me. dad. Yeah. yeah it's you know, it's really that, complicated. That could work because it's the sort of thing where like Victor is doing what Jareth wants him to do because Jareth has physical power over him. You know, like he's chained this guy up. He has a bunch of minions like pointing spiky things at Victor all day if he doesn't do what he wants. But like he's never broken Victor mentally. He wants Victor to admit that like Jareth is superior to him. And know? that's yeah. what Frankenstein's monster does, right? Be a nuisance. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Jareth's a real nuisance. <laughs> Oh, so I'm like so this. into this. Yeah. Okay, so it's, yeah. It's, I think that that's a good B plot. Maybe not overtly shippily, but certainly enough to launch a thousand fanfics. <laughs> that's right. right. <laughs> they have been built on less. <laughs> In this very podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel so seen and hurt. How dare you? Okay, that's our B story. Uh, now we're at the fun and games. This is the part of the movie that is the movie. So all of that stuff that we said was going to happen in the movie, that's like the stuff in the trailer. That's like the interesting stuff, the reason why it's here. This is what we're doing. The second act is the second act. It's fired in all cylinders. All the fun stuff, all the trailer moments, all that stuff. Well, so it's a lot of the comedy of manners stuff where Sheila is sort of trying to blend in with this uh, weird goblin court, trying to suppress kind of her own nature and instincts. And at the same time, she's sort of going around the castle in the places that Luna is directing her, finding like the pieces of the Witchblade to start assembling it, put it together. Uh, so yeah, I think it's I think it's just like a lot of interesting scenes where like she has to get to some place, and so she has to get on someone's good side, and so she has to like impress them with how civilized she is, you know? Right. Some like initiation rituals and stuff would be cool that she has yeah, to get through. Yeah. Totally. So I have an idea. They're at Goblin Dinner, and it's very fancy. It's a big, long table, and they have all the beautiful silverware laid out. There's, you know, goblets full of wine and water and all that other stuff. And then she's sitting next to this other goblin who's maybe one of the fanciest goblins. The real, you know, Beau Brummel of goblins. Uh (laughs) And then she's doing something a bit clumsily, and she spills her her wine, and you can see all the goblins sort of stop in their tracks, as though, and you follow the wine as it spills across that beautiful tablecloth. And that Beau Brummel goblin turns to her and is like, I can't believe you do something so clumsy. She turns to him and says, I can't believe you would be so rude as to mention it. And then all the other goblins are like, oh, oh, shit. The first time that she shows up, do they let her in right away? Or like, what is the cover that she gives for the reason why she wants to come back? I think she probably has to be a bit in disguise so they don't recognize her. I don't know. I think because I feel like she could pretend to be penitent. She can be like, I was wrong. This is the way that we should be living. You know, I've seen what the world has to offer. And I see now that Jareth was right. I don't know if you guys want to do this, but she could bring back Luna like as a prisoner and say like this thing got out and like give it back to him. And so Luna might be like in a little cage by Jareth a lot of the time. And she has to like sneakily talk to Luna. But like that's her way getting back in is like handing over Luna to Jareth. Yeah, that could work. Jareth has a fucking magic dance scene where he's throwing Luna into the air repeatedly. (laughs) Puts Luna in a striped shirt. (laughs) Oh, It could be a little bit fun too. We can play with, it doesn't actually have to happen because if she wants to get close to Jareth, Luna could be pushing her to like, maybe try to like, seduce him a little bit like oh, sex man. it up and yeah. like Sheila's really you know like she's like uh, I don't know and like does it but she's like trying to like seduce Jareth kind of like awkwardly and he's like oh I always thought you were a beast but you're so like fetching now or whatever you're such a classy monster oh. <laughs> like, yeah we definitely need an awkward seduction scene either with Jareth or with one of the other goblins right. but that's like one of the steps she has to take to get one of the pieces <laughs> okay listen we established how Jareth is what if Luna lets Sheila know ahead of time that Jareth is one of those dudes that wants you if he thinks you don't want him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So, like, Luna teaches Sheila how to act like a cat in that sassy kind of way. Where it's just like, 
nah, uh, I guess. Right. Nah, mm, uh, and, and that's actually really funny because that's more out of Sheila's nature because she's like, if I like someone, I'm just going to tell them and then we'll like bone like wolves. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just, you pee and then they smell your pee and they know you want them. So Sheila yeah. is pretending that she's interested in Jareth, but is pretending that she's not interested in Jareth. Right. Yes. In order to get Jareth, she's acting like she does not want Jareth, which she actually does not, but she has to do it even more so. (laughs) All right. So brilliant. Now we are going to arrive at the midpoint. Basically, up until now, it's all been fun games. Now things get serious. Now there is additional element that gets added into the plot. Things get more complicated, and there are additional goals that the main character is attempting to accomplish in addition to the things that they had to deal with before. So now, like, things shift gears and get more intense. So this sounds like it's probably her putting together the Witchblade, right? Like, she finishes at this point. The next kind of part of this story is where things turn bad. You know, bad guys close in, all that sort of thing. So I'm just kind of trying to anticipate that. So I feel like it could either be that Sheila's about to finish putting together the Witchblade, Jareth figures out what she's doing, and then throws her in the dungeon or whatever. And so she only has like a mostly completed Witchblade, but it's still not effective. Or it could be that... She completes the Witchblade, but then Jareth has some other trick up his sleeve that he springs on her when she attempts to kill him. I like the idea, and I don't know if we can make this work, but I like the idea that she puts it together now, and then in the, like, bad guys close in section, she launches, like, an ill-fated attempt at going after Jareth and, like, fights through a bunch of monsters in that section. Yeah. And, it's, and it, like, right here, it shifts gears into being action, and then there's an all is lost moment where, like, it doesn't go well, and then she kind of has to, like, regroup, and there's a bit of a dark moment, and then we go into a new, like, thing for the finale. Yeah, it could even be the sort of thing where, like, she gets maybe thrown into an adjacent cell as Victor. Right. And then the two of them kind of have to put their heads together and come up with a plan. We could have it be like that in order to use this Witchblade thing correctly, you need to exemplify the stuff that are like Sheila's good traits, which are our theme thingy of like being moral and like a beast on the outside, but like good on the inside. And she's kind of lost that a little bit in some way when she's in here. And so it doesn't fully work. And she has to like rediscover that at the end. Oh, so her first attack on Jareth goes badly because she hasn't attuned to the Witchblade because she's given herself over too much to the ways of Jareth and his clan. Yeah, she's like kind of bought in a little bit too much and it doesn't and it doesn't work. And she has to like relearn the lesson that she already knew at the beginning. Okay, yeah, I mean, I I think that that's sort of maybe what she can learn from Victor when they're thrown into prison together. So, um, yeah, the midpoint, she puts the thing together. Awesome magical girl Frankenpunk transformation sequence. And now she's got her techno organic lightning arm. And uh, then the bad guys close in section. It's a big old action thing. And she like fights a bunch of crazy monsters and is like uh, trying to go after Jareth. You know, like a comedy of manners. Like a comedy. Of, it doesn't have to be a comedy of manners throughout all of it. But so the idea then is that because she's not attuned to the Witchblade yet, like it's not acting at full power. So even when she fights Jareth, he's still able to beat her. Right. I even like the idea of it being very comedy of manners in that initial fight where Jareth's like, no, everybody stand back. I shall fight her in the traditional goblin manner, (laughs) you know, and just everybody clears their room or is at the edges of the room and they (gasps) duel. I just imagine the traditional goblin manner is Jareth begins singing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. So I, competitive like suddenly, contact juggling is the- they're, they're in an MC Escher painting all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. We could have a bit where like before this, one of the things that they've maybe done as I was like a flirty thing is they had like a fencing duel or something yes. like that. And it's like the classiest form of fighting. And like Sheila's kind of bad at it, but then like gets good at it and like beats Jareth at fencing like partway through the movie. And now she decides to like make the Witchblade into like a cool like fencing sword and is like fighting her way through with that. She fights Jareth at the end and gets defeated. And then the thing that she has to learn later is to rather than make it into that, to like make it into badass wolf claws and just like, and like rip her outfit off and just fight like a monster. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. So now we're at our all is lost moment. This is like kind of our hero's lowest point of the story where they're doubting everything and they have to, you know, figure out what to do next. So uh, what, what is our all is lost moment look like here? Well, so I think uh, Sheila's been thrown into the dungeons of Castle Jareth alongside <laughs> Victor. And it's here that they have this discussion where Sheila's like, I put the weapon together and I used it and it still wasn't enough. And this is where Victor tells her like, you can't play by their rules. You can't try to beat them on their own terms. Like you have to be true to yourself. The Witchblade's going to be a lot better when you're comfortable with it. And you're also going to be like a lot less predictable if you don't allow yourself to be controlled by their rules. Right. 
And and I think she's like saying whatever I was wanting to fight honorably though in the style that they advocated. And he's going to be like, that's not what fighting honorably means. What fighting honorably means is fighting for something good. You know what yeah. I mean? Fighting Aww. for a good cause. And you have a good cause. The witch boy's going to transform from like a classy suit of armor with a, with a sword into like just a badass, <laughs> all out monstrous suit of armor with big old claws and stuff. Yeah. Nice. So now we're at break into act three. This is where we enter into a f- the final arena that the last part of our story is going to take place in. There is oftentimes another symbolic crossing of a threshold. Do we want to see this crossing of a threshold is the, again, because are both of these, all of these threshold crossings are costume changes. So this is the, the <laughs> other costume change. That's how I like them. You know what? It should be a montage that's kind of like the mirrored version of the one we did at the beginning where it's like all of her fancy clothes are torn apart. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I like like the witch blade expanding outward and her assuming like a more natural and monstrous form. If Luna's in the dungeon as well, I appear to be like, I worked hard on that outfit. I thought it was really nice. (laughs) Now we're at our finale. It's our final showdown. So uh, what what do we think is going to happen in this finale? I mean, she fights her way through all of the mooks that were just recovering from her last assault. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In this sort of movie, the final battle kind of has to take part like on the outer walls of the castle or on like the ramparts or they're on top of the tallest tower and Jareth is like swinging his rapier at her and she keeps like snarling and slashing at him with her claws and you know it's a lot of like crumbling stonework and like flashes of lightning from storm clouds above. It might start off like in like his throne room or in that room where everybody hangs out and is partying all the time. But then like it kind of becomes a chase where she's like pushing him back maybe up into that area and then like kind of goes across the the whole castle and ends up on the roof because, you know, that's where you got to you got to have it end up. Yeah, she like kind of beats him through sheer like savagery and he's he's like, that's against the rules. This is a sword (laughs) fight. And (laughs) Jareth loses because he's too restricted by his own rules or... Sheila wins because she's not restricted by any rules. It could be him also being like vain is like kills mm-hmm. him where it's like <laughs> he's worried about like making sure his like his shirt and his cape and everything are, or whatever he's wearing are like arranged just so and that he has like the proper form and everything. And but it's like it's completely not necessary and it's just his own vanity. He's like fixing his hair or something and then he dies because of that. Straightening you know? his cod piece and then stab. straightening his cod piece. Yes. I actually like the idea that as the fight goes on, he's getting less and less buttoned up and he's getting kind of more like savage and instinctive and like his his clothing keeps getting torn up and like his wig is askew and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and like, and you can tell this is Sheila's comfort zone. You right. know, it's like fighting just purely on instinct. This is where she lives. And now Jareth has come into her world and he's completely unprepared for it. He could even, if like they have the ability to transform into animal forms, like he turns into his owl form, but he just sucks and he can't beat her because he's like he hasn't used his like animal powers in a while and they're just garbage like you know it's just an owl that's very good at contact juggling (laughs) (laughs) so now we're at closing image this is the part of the story where we talk about how things wrap up for our characters do we like the idea that she like reforms the rest of the monsters and is like the new alpha of them but is like making them nicer that oftentimes is how stories end when it's the flat arc because you want to have a change, but it's not the main character that changes. It's the main character sticks to their guns and then the world changes. I was kind of thinking it might be the sort of thing where like, so she's killed Jareth, goes back down into the castle where the rest of the goblin court is sort of just like standing there shocked. Sheila's just going to leave and one of the goblins says to her like, what do we do now? And she just says, whatever you want. Yeah. Oh, wow, dude. It's just like, that's the theme that she's shown to them. It's like, You don't have any rules now. Like, whatever it is that you want to do, just do it. You don't have to, like, be a servant to this guy. You don't have to do what he tells you. You can make your, you can decide what you want to be. I think that's good. I think her just, like, setting people free in that way would be, would be really interesting. Yeah. And then the Bo Brummel goblin rips his shirt off. (laughs) And then, like, dunks his head in a punch box. He's like, yes! (laughs) I feel so free. (laughs) What sort of an end do we have in mind for Luna and for Victor? Does Victor just get set free? Does Victor, like, tragically die at some part in the third act, like, trying to save Sheila? Or, you know, or something like that? Or does does Jareth kill Victor in a fit of rage during, like, that all is lost moment or something like that? I don't know. I don't. He's a weird character. I feel like he's not one that I'm always comfortable with the idea of him just continuing. Because I'm like, did you really learn to not make bad decisions, Victor? Right. Yeah, did I think you? he needs to die tragically. I just don't know how or when. 
I was kind of imagining him throwing himself in front of a blow that's meant for Jareth and that that would be his way of saying, like, I'm sorry I created you and then, you know, all this. Oh, I like that. I I just picture that being the kind of moment. Obviously, we have not led up to a thing where that makes a lot of sense for him to do. We could try to work towards that if you want. Like, if we have to, like, insert an earlier moment, we can, but... um, I mean, we were making that whole B-plot. I think it makes sense for this to be the area where it, like, concludes. I think maybe he tries to talk down Jareth when Jareth is like at a moment where he's about to finish off Sheila. Victor comes out, gives a heartfelt speech, and it's the sort of thing where like the music and the shot and the camera work and everything and the acting is really making you think that Jareth is going to consider it. And then he just like throws Victor off of the couch. Oh, like, this is our. <laughs> he summons like three of those little contact juggling balls underneath <laughs> Victor's feet and he stumbles down to his death. Earlier in the movie, when she gets her, she has her like rapier version and she's like fighting through all the monsters. She could free Victor here. So her and Victor are free. And then she goes up to kill him. And first Victor's like, let me talk to him. I bet I could talk to him some sense to him. And then he goes up and he's like, you know, all I wanted was for you to be great. And you are, you're so much more than I could have expected. And if I don't tell you that I'm proud of what I've made, I'm very proud of it. You know, that kind of thing. And then Jareth could be like, oh, I've waited years for you to say that. And then he like throws him off the roof, you know? (laughs) And then he's like, I am greater than you. And then he Uh. locks up Sheila. And then Luna's the one that gives her the speech of like, you know, oh, you need to fight him like you, you know? And and so Luna's the one who gives him that thing. And do do we like that? Yeah, Yeah. I think that makes sense. I like that a lot. All right, so any other closing scenes that we want? Where does Sheila end up? Where does Luna end up? Uh, Luna stays with Sheila, wherever that may be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like the, the closing scene is the same sort of montage we saw at the beginning of like Sheila doing things out in the wilderness, but Luna is with her and like Sheila's trying to teach Luna how to do these things. Could Sheila maybe have a couple of the nicer monsters with her? That she's like, she's like teaching them some wilderness things too? She has opened a beet farm! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she has her uh, little wolf pack now. Yeah, for sure. Because I, I like that she's kind of spreading this like lifestyle of hers a little bit more and teaching them to be like nice monsters, you know. That work at the farmer's market. So now that we finish, are there any other scenes or moments or things you guys want to clarify to set up earlier in the movie? I mean, the only thing I can say is that there's going to be some monsters earlier on that she maybe is probably going to have some little scenes with throughout it that you're going to realize these ones are not irredeemably bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Fleshing that out so that the theme hits a little harder at the end. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. Okay. blade transformation sequence? Oh, yeah. Or Sheila like goes naked but not where you can see anything and, and they're just the, lightning everywhere yeah it's way. like it's like he-man plus sailor moon <laughs> you're right it is i was imagining that when she first gets out after her transformation into kind of wolf rad frankenpunk thing that there's the sequence of her going through and all the other goblins going oh my god this is different and just going through and ruining things that are sort of part of the niceties of it like just knocking a vase off a table And then, like, pouring out a glass of whatever. And then ripping the carpet slightly. (laughs) And then setting a pillow down askew. Ah, what a nuisance. I know. And then as this is happening, Jareth is just watching in horror. It's like, oh, now you've gone too far. All right, so the only other thing that we need is a title. What are you guys thinking for this? I think one way we could go is to name it after the Witchblade equivalent in this, like whatever that device ends up getting called. We could do something like about being like related to the word like monster, like the monster something or the wolf something. There's also, you could do stuff with like skins because it's both skin walkers is a thing. And then there's also the idea of appearances and, you know, versus true beings. And Sheila wears like wolf skins and stuff like that. You know, we his place, we could also do something about it being the den or whatever. Like that could be the name of his thing thing like so into the den of whatever you know i was I thinking know. like the court of the goblin king or something like that right 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 yeah. i do like that well okay bob what are typical like a uh, comedy of manners titles <laughs> a lady of no importance like that kind of thing the importance of being earnest yeah a lot of importance oh, the okay. importance of wolves <laughs> that's so fucking dumb i can't <laughs> believe i said <laughs> So, oh, of, of <laughs> manners and monsters. Oh of my mon- god! Of monsters and manners? That's like a romance, like, oh, yeah, that's such right. a good but- title. A wolf of no importance. <laughs> Oh my god, that's so cute. Because it's like, she didn't, she's not important in their world, but she is important. A wolf in sheep's clothing? That's a thing? 
No, a wolf in something's clothing. A wolf in fop's clothing. <laughs> a wolf in cheap clothing. <laughs> in, in cheap she- clothing. Oh, that's really cute. Oh, <laughs> gosh. I really, I like that one. I like it. I don't know. Kind of winning me over a little bit. What about like a play on Howl? Howls and Owls. <laughs> Howls and Owls. Howls and Owls. Oh my God. That's a Halloween movie. <laughs> uh, no. A Howl in Good Time. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's going to be the like quotes at yeah, the, the bottom review. of the poster. Right, of course. I, I like a wolf in sheep clothing. For me, the one that does it the most is the, is the wolf in sheep clothing. I know it's dumb and like silly, but I, I kind of, I think it combines both saying the, the plot and also just being like a funny name and not just being like too serious. I mean, it does dumb have and a silly. certain like DreamWorks movie quality to oh, it. Oh my god! Well, now I like it less. <laughs> no, dumb and silly is like it's my brand. It'll I love be it. the How to Train Your Dragon. Of, yeah, there of you this. go. It's a real kung fu panda. <laughs> oh my god! What I don't want is now it's it's like Sheila on the cover doing the weird smirk and like shrugging. No, it's fine. Like, it's gonna be good though. It's gonna and now be it's good. becoming that movie, and I don't. <laughs> no, no, no. It's more no. of the Emperor's New Groove. You know? Yeah. Sure. You know what? The Emperor's New Groove is a terrible title, and uh, How to Train Your Dragon <laughs> is not a very good title. It doesn't really oh, tell no. you what's going on in the movie, so. We'll, uh, we'll deal with that I think it tells one. you exactly what happens in the movie. Well, you know what? Those movies are all great, and this movie is great. So yeah, I think we got it. This movie's going to be like box office gold, <laughs> and not like that goblin gold that disappears after you get it. All right. We'll go with that. A wolf in cheap clothing. It's fine. <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's Good. gonna be at the bottom of the poster. Yeah, it's fine. No, we've already decided. <laughs> Two stars. The, bo- the bottom of the poster is it's a howling good time or whatever. So. <laughs> yeah, one star. Right. Yeah. Some they they this reviewer just wrote the shrug emoji. <laughs> <laughs> one and a half stars. Right. Look, I don't care. I'm buying the director's cut. Fuck those people. Tap. Oh, the cat thinks. Ooh. Oh. Hey, yeah, a little cat with a moon crest on its head just brought me this list of awesome people. <sighs> How apropos. Over to Twitter. Thank you to Jonathan Dye, Decade Fan, Matias Totimez, Jeff Rick Present, Florian, Vladimir Duran, Cosplay Fiend, Cosplay Devotee, Sean Boyd, Flan Butt 96. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's real good. The Pop Culture Failure Podcast, JD Ketch, Earth Mofo, also known as Rafael Medina, uh, Hayden, and Jake. Over to Tumbles. Thank you to Fat Blunt 69. Fat Blunt 69. Mm-hmm. Right. Congrats on getting married, my dude. <gasps> nice. Yeah. And Sid Rabbit Blog. Oh, and hey. on Facebook, <laughs> thank you to Jay Arthur, Tom Grow, and Adam Mayo. Thank you, guys. Thank you for always spreading the love. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Collaboratory. Next week will be our 33rd episode of Extraordinary League. And the week after that, our first match of Smashtoberfest 2018. And, ow, it's a werewolf match. Lucian from Underworld versus John Talbain from Darkstalkers versus Angua von Überwald from Discworld versus Scott Howard from Teen Wolf. Smash Metafiction is produced by Dan Mulcairin, with logo designed by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, The Builder. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. It could be that, you know, she finds out that the final piece of the Witchblade is like something that is on Jareth's person at all oh, times. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Oh. At which, which kind of like increases <laughs> the stakes on the whole seduction thing. Yeah. Right. I um, can't. Are you imagining it in that stupid cod piece? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think someone here was. Oh, you're brilliant. <laughs> it's where, where, why is that cod piece so big? Because there's right? a Witchblade in there. Yeah, there's a whole front part of the gauntlet in there. <laughs> Now we have a movie. Great. (laughs) It's also on the bottom of the first. (laughs)
<laughs> now we have a movie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Four stars. <laughs> oh my god! Fits the dictionary definition of a movie. <laughs> Peter Trevor, <laughs> Graham Stone. I'm actually crying. Why is this my new favorite thing? A.O. Scott says it exists. <laughs> the Onion AV Club says the best kind of movie, a real one you can see. <laughs>